Welcome to Firearms Friday, coming to you from the Wyoming State Museum in Cheyenne. My name is Evan Green. I'm the firearms historian for the museum. And since I've about finished going through the 300 firearms in the collection, I've been asked to move on to take a look at the edged weapons, swords, knives, bayonets that we have in the permanent collection. And I wasn't too excited about that at first because I didn't know anything about swords. I've been uh, familiar with firearms for decades, but swords is kind of a new area for me. But once I got into it, it's fascinating. Uh, the history of swords, the impact that they've had on cultures across the world. So what we have here today is an 1860 cavalry officer's sword. And this belonged to and was donated by a guy named James Torrey. I'm sorry, J. Torrey. And Mr. Torrey was a Wyoming rancher. He was a member of the Wyoming legislature. And in order to kind of appreciate Mr. Torrey and this particular sword, I want to kind of go into the background story. And let's talk about the late 19th century and the run-up to the Spanish-American War. In those years, Spain was kind of the sick man of Europe. Spain had lost almost all of their colonies on the continental Americas. They still had Cuba, they had the Philippines and Guam. Um, and they had been, Cuba had been in the throes of a revolution for years and years. And the most recent one was called the Ten Years' War. And the Cubans were trying to gain their independence from Spain. And Spain implemented some really horrific conditions, concentration camps. They burned villages. Uh, they starved people. People died of disease because they were confined to these concentration camps. And that caused some concern uh, on the part of the United States government. McKinley was president at the time. But I suspect that some of the concern was motivated by the disruption of America's, the United States, commercial interests in Cuba. We had sugar cane plantations and sugar processing plants in Cuba, and there was the potential for that disruption. So McKinley decided in January, February of 1898 to send the battleship Maine to Cuba to kind of make a statement that the United States is watching what's happening in Cuba. And on February 15th of 1898, the battleship Maine blew up, and the immediate response was that, oh my God, it's a Spanish mine. Spain has blown up an American battleship. There was even an investigation at the time that said that, yes, it was an external event that blew up the main. There have been investigations since, and while I believe it has not been definitively established, it is probably likely that it was an explosion in the coal bunkers on the ship. Uh, the quality of coal that they were using off-gassed and sometimes started spontaneously a fire in that coal bunker. And the coal bunker on the forward portion of the main was right next to the magazine where uh, armament and powder was stored. So the main sank and there was an outcry and concern in the United States. William Randolph Hearst and his uh, yellow journals uh, coined the phrase, uh, remember the Maine and to hell with Spain. And he was supported in that warmongering by the man who was at the time the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt really wanted to go to war with Spain. Spain. And Congress, President McKinley, responded. War was declared against Spain April 23rd of 1898. 
And it was a fairly short war. Uh, within 90 to 120 days, Spain was in contact with France to begin negotiations to end that war, which was finally concluded by uh, the Treaty of Paris on December 10th, 1898. So as not uncommon at the time these events were occurring, the United States Standing Army was depleted. It happens when we end the war and go into a peacetime, let's cut military spending. We have not learned that lesson. So McKinley called for 125,000 volunteers from states and territories, and each state and territory was given a quota of the volunteers they were to have and the units they were to establish. So Wyoming responded. We uh, developed a volunteer light artillery battery. We developed an infantry regiment and we developed the second volunteer United States Cavalry called Tory's Rough Riders. So Tory trained his troops and in late June loaded men, equipment, and horses on two trains en route to Tallahassee, Florida with the expectation that they would go to Cuba. But as the trains reached Tupelo, Mississippi, the first train stopped to take on water and the second train ran into the back of the first train at about 30 miles an hour. Five soldiers, a conductor employed by the railroad were killed in that crash, and Tory was injured, so it became pretty apparent that they were not going to make it. They eventually got to Tallahassee, but it was pretty clear that they were not going to make it to Florida, or to, to, uh, they made it to Florida, pretty clear they were not going to make it to Cuba. And it's kind of interesting that uh, Tory, and it has to do possibly with the provenance of this sword, but Tory went to Washington, D.C. between the time the Maine sank and uh, the declaration of war, met with President McKinley and General of the Army uh, at the time, Nelson Miles, and asked about raising a volunteer cavalry regiment. He was given the green light, came back to Wyoming, and did so. So, uh, even before the war, Tory had been mentioned as a possible running mate for McKinley in the 1900 election. So if he had made it to Cuba, and if he had been involved in some heroic uh, incident that equaled or exceeded Theodore Roosevelt's charge up San Juan Hill, we might have had a Wyoming man as a vice president, and after McKinley's assassination, he might have been the president. But he could not match uh, Theodore Roosevelt's self-promotion. So about this sword, again, it's a 1960, 1860 cavalry officer's sword. And it was donated to the museum. Two swords were donated to the museum. And as always, it is, it is valuable if we can establish provenance or tie other people or incidents to the artifacts we have. So while I was doing some research downstairs in state archives, I came across this letter dated July 1, 1898, which the train wreck occurred June 26, 19, 1898. So this was after the train wreck. But this is a letter addressed to Dear Colonel from George L. Shoup. It says, Dear, my dear Colonel, my son, Lieutenant Shoup, will hand you an officer's saber, which I beg you to accept as a partial consideration of the high esteem in which I hold you as an officer and gentleman. With it, I convey my warmest regards and the sincere hope that you will carry it victoriously through many well-earned conflicts with the enemy. I hope to be able to see you and your men before you embark for Cuba or Puerto Rico, but I cannot leave at the present on account of the Hawaiian resolutions now pending in the Senate, 
which necessitates the attendant of, attendance of all the friends of the measure. In 1898, the United States annexed Hawaii as a territory. So, with warm regards, regards I am faithfully yours, yours, George L. Shoup. Well, who is George L. Shoup? This is on letterhead of the United States Senate. So, in nine, eight, God, I keep saying 19, 18, in 1898, Shoup was the senator from Montana. He had previously been the territorial governor and unfortunately was president, present with the uh, first, wife, first Colorado Volunteer Cavalry at Sand Creek. So, is this the sword? I wish we could confirm that because there were two swords donated and unfortunately the information that came in with them is very limited. The second sword is currently not in the collection and not available for uh, examination. So there's really no way to tell if this is the sword that Shoop gave to J. Torrey, or if it was the other one which is currently not in the collection. <clears throat> kind of frustrating, 50% chance that this letter refers to this sword. And kind of my, my speculation is that when, so when Tory went to Washington, D.C. to talk to President McKinley and General Miles, he may have purchased a cavalry officer's sword because one thinks they might not have been as readily available in Cheyenne, Wyoming as they were in Washington, D.C. But again, unfortunately, there's no way to tell whether that's the sword or whether this is the sword. So, okay, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for some more videos on edged weapons. And I still have some firearms that I will talk about in other videos as well. So thank you for watching.